conversation through a, a series of photographs and reflections from David. Um, before we start, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about your uh, your perspective on the word perspective. Yeah, well, for me, it's a, it's an internal thing. It's about embracing what's authentic and true about yourself and not allowing external forces to define that for you. So it's about finding what your perspective is and then understanding that it should never stay the same. It should always be shifting and changing and growing. And how do you navigate that in your own internal experience? Just by meeting as many different types of people as I can, um, having really interesting conversations, uh, putting myself in places where I've never been before, um, being inside prisons, being inside shelters, not not just visiting and serving a meal, but you know, really beginning to develop relationships so that there are friendships that you have with people who are in supportive housing, friendships that you have with people who are serving time, um, friendships that you have with students that you work with. Um, it's just about it, the, the more you hear, the more you uh, hear people's stories, the more you watch their lives, the more you shift your perspective of going, oh, the world isn't just through the lens that I have. It's There's a collective lens too. And it's about constantly working toward that collective lens. So we talked about that in our discussion is just that perspective is about relationship. Right. And that it is redefined yeah. through our relationships with others. And so that's part of the reason we felt a conversation yeah. might be the best way to share this um, this this theme with all of with all of you. Um, so I have a photo up here, and David, maybe you can just take a look at this photo and tell us a little bit about um, your perspective on it and what's what's happening here. In one word, it's insanity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but in another word, um, it's evidence. That's the way I would look at it. It's evidence that. You know, when you go to somebody, when I when I decided to come back here, um, it was at the advice of a young man who grew up in Bexley. Uh, his name was Josh Radner, and he was, at that time, starting on the show called How I Met Your Mother. And he was making all this money in L.A., and doing all this kind of stuff, and I had just experienced Katrina. I had just moved from New York to New Orleans with this idea called Harmony Project. And uh, three months after I moved there, Katrina happened. And I went out to L.A. and I started telling Josh about this idea. He said, if this needs to happen in Columbus, I didn't think it could. And I didn't think that I wanted to be in Columbus again. Um, uh, because in my mind, I had what Columbus was. And it wasn't quite what, where I wanted to be, I thought. And, um, and, I, and I decided to try a 10-week version of this. Because everybody was saying Columbus is the uh, pilot capital of the world or something, you know. So I was like, okay, we'll try it. And the pitch was, I'm starting a choir and you don't have to be able to sing. And the first reaction was, well, why would anyone want to hear that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I think, oh yeah, there's, uh, yeah, look at that. You know I was gay? You know I was gay already at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I've been struggling with this playground. Drop it, I put it everywhere. So great, great. So that's evidence that, that if you don't listen to someone who says, I don't understand your concept or your idea, and if you just put your nose down and you keep going and you say, no, I do believe this can work. The concept is we don't ask who you voted for because kids who want a playground in the neighborhood don't care who you voted for. We don't ask who you worship or if you worship or how you worship. We don't ask how you define yourselves. Um, we just say there's work to be done. And what we use is we just found music. To, to find something that every one of those people have in common. I try to remind them not to assume that the person next to them is going to necessarily agree with what their opinions are. But it's, those things aren't gonna change. That's the part of what, why I wanted Harmony to start, is that I became frustrated with the fact that we kept trying to find resolution. And I don't think resolution is going to ever happen because it hasn't ever happened in human history. So what we want to find is cooperation and collaboration. And if we can accomplish something, even though we disagree, then does it really matter that we disagree? Because we have something to accomplish. So to me, that's the evidence of that. I hear a theme here when you're talking about you as a person being out in the world and connecting and building relationships with folks who have a very different perspective than you have. And then you're bringing that as a person to 
Harmony Project and inquire and um, give them the opportunity to build relationships with people who are just as unknown. And that's so important and so um, devalued in a culture where our beliefs kind of become our identity and then we really need to protect that. So what a beautiful thing. I don't know if you all know this, but you do not have to audition to be a member of Harmony Project Choir, which is really incredible. So every, you know, it's, it's definitely a model of everyone is welcome. Well, and also, you know, uh, it, just like in this room right here, I mean, all these chairs are full on Monday nights. And if I walk into the middle of the choir, it sounds terrible. I mean, it, it sounds awful. But if I come 10 steps back, it sounds a lot better. And then when I get up here, it sounds magical. And it sounds incredible. Because it's a not too soul metaphor of that when we drill down too much and just listen to individual voices all the time, then our perspective is only about that individual voice. But then we, and in harmony, in music, harmony cannot exist with only one note. So I believe harmony can exist in the community with only one way of thinking, one way of being, one way of identifying. So we have to kind of shape that up a little bit. And I mean, that's a very hard one perspective for you. Sure. Because we talked a lot about your childhood right. and the very different perspective that your family had on you versus the one that you had about yourself. Right. So maybe you can introduce us to uh, Baby David. Sure. Well, that's two-year-old. Um, Damn, I'd give everything for that hair line with that, uh, <laughs> that skin right now. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, so they wanted me to be the, they wanted me to be the ring bearer, but I wanted to be the flower girl instead. So uh, even though they put me in the tux, I got, to, and you see the tongue sticking out. I mean, I was already like getting what I wanted. Yeah, I was raised in the very conservative, evangelical Southern Baptist um, tradition in Louisiana. And, uh, one way of thinking, one way of being. We all went to the same places to eat. We all believed the exact same stuff, and I was, you know, really indoctrinated into the cult um, very well. Uh, competed in Bible drills and traveled around the country with singing groups to save all the non-Baptists. Um, you know, did all of that, and uh, you know, my first major life kind of shift perspective was um, just a little bit older than this. That's the homecoming queen there. And then, I, and then he's with uh, somebody else in the car because she's supposed to be the homecoming queen, but obviously I was. <laughs> That's, everybody who's ever seen this photograph of my house is like, is that your JFK shot? Like, what is that? Um, I'm like, yes, I was, I was a month old whenever he uh, was assassinated. Um, but um, I was four. And, uh, and we were living in some small town, and it's hot Louisiana uh, summer day. And our, my family was really pretty poor. And uh, we lived in a really, really tiny little house at that time, cracked driveway, cracked concrete driveway. And there was a big ditch out in the front, because in Louisiana, there's water everywhere. So you have to have drainage, you know? And, um, and I, I, I don't really remember making the mud but I decided that I was gonna make mud pies. And that was something that you did in the South. You'd get your mud, pour it out on the driveway, let them bake um, in the sun. And my mother had thrown out uh, a spice rack and had gotten a new one. And I had asked if I could have the old, the old spice rack. Um, there's a branding opportunity for you there to get a sponsor. Um, so, I, uh, um, so I had asked if I could have that old spice rack, and I'd fill up all the bottles with like rocks and grass and all my spices in it. And I'm out there sprinkling my mud pies. And my grandmother, my mother was like eight months pregnant, it's my baby sister. And my grandmother was visiting. And my grandmother and my mother came out, and they were standing under the carport. And I'm making the mud pies. And I think the only reason I remember this moment is because I heard my grandmother say something. And she said to my mother, Linda, we need to get him some boy toys. And I felt my face get hot. And I'm only four, you know? And I didn't know why I felt the heat. And I didn't know why I felt like something was wrong with me. But the tone in the voice said to me, oh, what I'm doing right now is not what I'm supposed to be doing. And then the Christmas that followed that was military themed. 
gifts, you know, little plastic army men, um, a cap gun, those of you who know what cap guns are, the rolls of caps. Yeah, I just started huffing that shit. <laughs> uh, um, I was like breaking those caps up. Yeah, man, you know? They had no idea what they were doing to me um, in the late 60s. And then uh, and they gave me a G.I. Joe, and that had a, not the effect that they wanted it to have. Um, I, I became a little fascinated with his, like, Non non gender identity. Um, and it was I had raised so many questions for me, um, but it also kind of gave me like my type, you know. And I'm four years old, and I now have the type. Um, this is he's my man. That's what he is. Um, and you pull a string, and he can talk to you. The perfect man. He can only speak when you pull a string. Um, so anyway. But, but in that moment was when I went, something is not right about me. Something's wrong with me. And that message continued to just grow and, and take root within my psyche and my soul because my perspective, not knowing that when I was four, but my perspective shifted from one of innocence of I'm just who I am to who I am is not right. And so that really begins to shape all the next decisions they make in life. And then you had a conversation with a therapist that shifted your perspective again. Yep. So see, this is why she's here. Um, I warned her. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, in the Baptist tradition and some of the more conservative traditions, there's, uh, there's different versions of this, but it's called conversion therapy. And my version of it was um, they isolate you from all television, um, all, I mean, there wasn't really media uh, in the mid eight, early mid eighties, but you can't watch television. The reason I couldn't watch television is because Dynasty at that time had a gay character on it, even though he wasn't officially gay. Um, and that you couldn't have any outside influence. You can only have the Bible. You can only have the people who the, were approved by the church to talk to you. And we started in a therapy that wasn't going well, sitting in complete darkness, squeezing your eyes real hard, and then seeing colors because you squeezed your eyes so hard. And then they would tell you those colors were demons and that you had to name those demons so that they could be cast out of you. And I was sinking into a very deep depression. And thankfully my parents were like, well, let's try some other approach. And we went to the Methodist Children's Home because that was where the free therapy was. And the therapist met with my parents and me and then said to my parents, next session, I'm just going to meet with him. And I went to my second session and there was the, one of the biggest life perspective changes of all. She said to me something that was so simple and innocent. And she just said, is there anywhere else you can go? Is there any other place that you can get away to go. And I had never imagined, because I couldn't imagine that. that, that possibly I was not the problem. Mm. The situation I was in was the problem. And that began a master plan to escape. And I had a friend that I had been going to college with at Louisiana Tech University who was now going to the Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio. And um, I managed to uh, find a way to call her um, because everything was monitored, phone calls, everything were monitored, and told her what I was going through. And she said, if you can find a way to get up here, you know, you can stay with me. And that was 1985. And I found my way to a Greyhound bus station. They got on my Greyhound bus without really knowing what I was doing. and landed downtown at the old Greyhound bus station. And uh, that was my first introduction to go up bus and what you know, as, as a listener to that story, I think the perspective shift for folks to identify differently for whatever reason, um, having that recognition that it's, it's not us, it's right. the world. It's the world. Yeah, and having the strength and the inner resource to find our community. Right. Right? Um, so thank you so much for sharing that beautiful story. 
Um, so on this this theme of like finding the place that we belong, um, you've been on a long journey to find, as you can name your your logical family versus your biological family. Right. And so I have another picture here um, that I'd love for you to talk about. Sure. Well, this is our adoption attorney. That's the probate judge. This is Kule right here, and this is Crispian. And Kule and Crispian and I became an official adopted family in 2017, but we first began to live together in 2015. I have been fortunate in our work with Harmony to go to South Africa, where our women, our incarcerated women's program at ORW in Marysville sings to children in hospice care in South Africa. It used to be monthly, right now it's like two to three months. Um, and they invited us to come meet the children that we had been singing with for over two years. And so two of us flew that 17 hour flight um, all the way over there. And you're on the other side of the world and you're walking up to this building and there are children inside screaming your name. You feel like a rock star, you know? And, um, and when I got there, uh, I, I reawakened within me this idea that I had always wanted to have a child, to have a family. And there was a child there named Ublayla who looked like he was about three, but he was six, but malnutrition had kind of stunted his growth a bit. And he kind of latched on to me that week. And, and we spent a lot of time together and we spent time in this place and it really opened my mind again to becoming a dad. And I thought about adopting him or one of the other children that were there. And then I, after I got back and realized the complications of trying to deal with their country, our country, um, you know, his illnesses, his health, it became, and I had, I had sold the little Mini Cooper, the little old Mini Cooper that I had, I got the bigger car, I had emptied out my office and made it to a little bedroom, a, boy, a bedroom for a little boy, I had done all what the universe tells you to do, like prepare and then it will happen, you know? um, and I had done everything that I thought I needed to do to be ready from a very naive perspective, of course, and, um, and then when that, when that reality was that that wasn't going to happen, I sank into a very dark time um, of going, science too late. You know, I've missed this. The one thing that I wanted, you know, I had missed. And it was about three weeks later, Chrismian, um, who I only knew these two kids because they were in a program that I was running at South High School. Um, Crispian calls me and says, Mr. David, Kool-Aid's family's in trouble. The police have taken him and all the other kids away. Can you come help? He didn't know who to call. And a month later, on my birthday, I was sitting in juvenile court because there was no one else to show up for one of the boys. And the magistrate says to me, well, are you willing to take him into your home? Because if not, he's going back into detention. And I knew what was going on in the family, and I knew that this, if there were good attorneys involved, this would all get resolved. But I knew without that, he was going to become a statistic in the system. And I'm sitting in this courtroom, and it's my birthday, and there is this African child sitting next to me, Liberia, from Liberia. And I'm thinking to myself, I was just in Africa asking the universe to help me figure out how to have what Armistead often calls the logical family, not the biological family. And it all fell apart. And here I am sitting here again on my fucking birthday. <laughs> and this judge says, and so I asked me that question. And I turned to Kool-Aid and I said, is that what you want? And he was like, yes, please. And I didn't know what the hell I didn't know how I was going to have two, you know, a 16-year-old coming into my home. I didn't know how to cook. I was a New Yorker. My oven was a bookcase in the city. You know? I, I knew how to make frozen fish sticks and frozen french fries. Otherwise, I ordered out, you know, because that was the only way I had to eat. And, um, and he moved in, and two weeks later, Crispian, his best friend, uh, who was also in the foster system, moved in. And then all of a sudden, there's two teenage boys in my house. And all of a sudden, I'm like, what the hell have I done? <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. But what happened was the universe responded 
in a way that I could never have imagined that it would respond. And it completely shifted my perspective of what family was to that family is what you create. Family is not what you're necessarily born into. And that there's always room to redefine it. And especially uh, in the queer community, that's so incredibly important right. to be able to define the actuals of right. right. And in being, one of the words that I heard you, just, you say is open. Be open to something being not what you imagined it to be, but right. like what's presented to you. And if you would have been closed minded to this looking differently, then you know, that, that family wouldn't have been possible. If I had let the fear of not knowing what to do stop me, then I wouldn't have done this, and then I wouldn't have grown as much as I've grown and been able to be a part of such milestone moments of their lives, which allowed me internally to then heal and forgive some of the ways that my parents had kind of, in my perspective, failed me. And it's not that they failed me, it's that they didn't have the tools to know what to do either. I'm not, I'm not admonishing them you know, of all of this, but I'm saying that it helped me go, I can I can now celebrate this as opposed to only holding on to the anger about that. The hope yeah. infuse your perspective. That I can do Shit. for them what I didn't feel was done for me. And that's that intergenerational feeling that's yeah. possible when we're able to like dig in and, right. and know ourselves and bring our gifts into the world as we've been able to do so beautifully. Um, so we have just a, a minute left. It's, it's, I'd like to ask, is there anything that you'd like to share with the audience in regards to what you would love for them to take away from your life experience and the perspective shifts that you've had? I've learned to everyone. Um, I mean, I guess I would say that... Judge. I mean, this isn't... This is a groundbreaking. This is just really simple. And that is, I mean, our perspectives shift constantly. Your perspective can shift in the grocery line, Kroger's, you know. But unless we act on those perspective shifts, then it's just observation. And I don't think observation really does much for us. I think action is where it happens. And I can observe different people, different ways of thinking different opinions. I can observe all that, but if I don't shift, then the observation was just kind of selfish on my part. But if we act on the perspective change, we're the beneficiary of it. It's selfish. It's an incredibly selfish thing. But as I've learned in therapy over the last many years, selfish isn't a bad word. It depends on how it's, how it's utilized. So I would just say to remember that once your perspective does shift, then don't go back. Keep acting on that and wait for the next one to happen. Because it's come. I just was in a conversation yesterday that you and I had no idea was coming. That was a monumental perspective shift of me and someone sitting across the table from each other who were in conflict because I remember that person saying something a certain way and, and that person remembered me saying something a certain way. And we thought we were never going to be able to get back together. And getting together and being brutally honest with one another allowed us to see that our two opinions were actually not over here. They were that close. And it was just one or two things that they needed to shift. And we left with an expression of love, an expression of we're so relieved to be back in each other's lives. And I emailed her this morning and said, unbelievable what that conversation called was a preamble for me to be in this room today, that shifts are constantly available to us and accessible to us. We just have to take them. Thank you so much. I, I Just the words that come to mind as, as we're closing here is, um, you know, unity and authenticity and how those two things are connected. And um, just the question, what, what do we owe to one another? And it, from my perspective, one of the things I think we owe is to know ourselves so that we can show up in those conversations yeah. in such an authentic way. Um, folks, can we please give Dana Brown a big <laughs>